Amen. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for calling us here to this place. We thank you for being our king, our Lord, our rock, our God, our shepherd. We thank you for being our everything, our all in all. We thank you for being our healer. We thank you for being our deliverer, our redeemer. We thank you for being our rock of our salvation, Lord. We thank you for being our firm foundation, Lord. We thank you for being the chief cornerstone as which all the other stones that are added to the building of the church are built off of. They're built off of you, Jesus. We thank you because you've never left us. We thank you because we've never been alone even when we felt like we're alone. We thank you because you've always lifted us up and carried us over. We thank you because you've always taken us to the top. We thank you because even when we've been at the bottom, you've carried us back up to the top. We thank you because even when we turned and when we walked away, you stayed and you sat right there and you waited for us to come back. We thank you because even in your waiting, you still reached out and the long arm of the Lord stretched out to us and said, come back to me, my child. Come back to me, my son. Come back to me, my daughter. I love you so much. Hear me now and know how much I care about you. We thank you because you love us through our filth. We thank you because you love us through our junk. We thank you because you love us when we're in a funk. We thank you because you are who you said that you are. We thank you that we have something, someone, somebody, a God to depend on, even when we can't depend on nobody else. We thank you because when we have nobody else to talk to, we can talk to you. We thank you because you got a listening ear and you got action behind it, Lord. We thank you because when you speak, something moves. When you speak, demons tremble. When you speak, walls they fall. When you speak, strongholds are loose, hallelujah, and bondage is broken. We thank you, Jesus. We believe God today. We believe for a move of God today. We believe for miracles today. We believe for signs of healing. We believe that you will heal somebody in this place. We believe you, God. Hallelujah. And we pray that you speak through the speaker and you teach through the teacher and you preach through the preacher, Lord. And you bring forth a word that glorifies you, that edifies your body, that makes somebody leave up out of here feeling better than when they came in. That makes somebody leave up out of here rejuvenated and refreshed and knowing their word. Hallelujah. So then faith come by hearing and hearing by the what? The word of God. Bring forth a word today, Lord, so if someone does not have faith, they will have it now. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 The sermon today is called I won't always be a patient. I won't always be a patient. I'm um, the sermon today. You know, we have an interesting church. I'm going to just start there. I'm, I'm going to just go for the whole juggler right away. We have an interesting church. We have a church where we have a lot of people who aren't pre-churched. Um, we have a lot of people who haven't been to church in a while and they started coming to Foundations Church. We have a lot of people who need a lot of healing, who've been sick, um, who suffer from a lot of things. Um, we have a lot of people who... are in the process of healing, but don't fully understand what that looks like. We have a lot of people who claim to be in the process of healing, but don't even know that they've already been made whole. Don't let that go over your head. And in the process of this, it doesn't make it an easy church. See, it doesn't make it a church where everybody shows up with glitz and glamour and everybody is blessed and everybody says, oh, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And people pull up in Benzes and Ferraris and, 
and brand new SUVs and everything like that and people own businesses and all that. We don't have that here. Maybe one day, Lord willing, I'm not against that. Go ahead and own your business and go ahead and get a great job and do what you got to do. But we don't have that. And the reason why I'm saying this is because when we're saying I won't always be a patient, it should be patient, but it says sick, so that's on me. Um, but I won't always be a patient. Either way, it goes hand in hand. I won't always be a patient is because as we grow together with our healing process, we'll start to learn and we'll start to see that we don't always have to be a patient in this hospital that we claim we need to heal from other things. See, and I'm saying this because, and I brought up our church because our mission and our vision is to be a space and a place um, for those who are lost and broken and to be a, a, a space and a place where the broken are healed and the lost are found. And we say that church is a hospital for sick people. So I have to mention our church because in my opinion, you don't have to agree with me, but in my opinion, our church kind of epitomizes the fact of the church is a place for the sick and the church is a hospital. Um, and why do I say that? Well, I'll just go back to what I said in the beginning. A lot of people here have never really been members of a church. A lot of people here don't even fully understand Jesus and the body of Christ. A lot of people are learning and growing and understanding in who he is and what he did and understanding what it's like to have relationship with him. So in that essence, because that's the stage that we're in, we're seeing Foundation Church as a place for the people who need a healer. Yeah. for the people who come because they're looking for a hospital and not the hospital with the Surgeon General symbol on it or with the red cross on it in the white background, but they're looking for the surgeon of Jesus. But I want to preach this message today because I also want to give us this. The church is a hospital for sick people, but just like a real hospital, sick people want to leave the hospital. Come on. Nobody goes to the hospital to stay sick. They go to the hospital to see the doctor, to get a healing, and they're going about their business. Church is the same way. You better preach, man. Church is the same way. I know we're here because we need a healing and we need a deliverance. But then the question becomes, I'm healing, I, I, I need a healing, and I need a deliverance, but I don't want to be a patient anymore. So I want to preach this message today because I, I want to preach to some people, but I want to preach to everybody because I want you to understand that you don't always want to be a patient. That you don't always want to be sick. You don't always want to be the one in the hospital who constantly needs to heal from something. You want to eventually be the one who's whole enough to leave the hospital. And we'll get to the reasons is why. But you don't always want to be a patient because who wants to go to the hospital and stay forever? Who wants to go to the hospital and never heal? If I went to the hospital and the doctor couldn't heal me, I would go to another hospital and another hospital and another hospital until I'm finally whole. And see, because we compare church to the hospital, the way we jump hospitals, we may jump faiths. So I need to be able to understand that I don't want to be a patient anymore. See, a part of this healing game with Jesus is the faith and belief that he healed me, that he bore my sicknesses and my diseases, that he bore my mental disabilities. A part of this thing with Jesus is believing that there was a healing there and I don't always have to be a patient. And the reason why this is important is because so many people flood churches on Sundays because they feel like they're sick and they need a healer. And that is important and that is why you are here. But then there's the flip side of it of this. I need to start flooding the church on Sunday because I've been healed. See, we don't talk about that enough. Flood the church because you've been healed, not just because you want to be healed. If you've been healed, you should be flooding the church even more because you know what healing feels like. You know what wholeness feels like. You know what God being on the inside of your heart feels like. You know what the overseer of your soul has done for you. And I flood church and I pastor a church and I love the church, not because I still need to be healed from everything, but because he healed me and he made me whole. 
Him making me whole is what motivates me to get to this place. Him making me whole is what motivates me to be in this space. Him making me whole. And for those of us who haven't been made whole, and your motivation is you still need to heal, you leave here today with this. I won't always be a patient. Can I say this to my church folks now? Come on. The number one thing with church people is we think that we always supposed to be sick. Church people got this thing. Well, you know, I'm always, you know, and you can't, you can't blame me. You know, you can't. My church people. Jesus came to die so we don't have to be sick anymore. Let's go. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. If you could stand for the reading of the word, that would be a blessing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. Yeah, I added these verses about 20 minutes ago. So you're going to see 24 and 25 on the screen. But in my prayer session, if I came up here, um, I felt led to add 21, 22, and 23. So don't look at the screen yet. Look at the screen in a few minutes. Don't be mad at me. I, me and God had a conversation. And I felt like we had to add these texts. Amen? Amen. But one thing, thank God for Sister Sasha. She fixed sick to patient. She said, hey, them scriptures ain't on the screen. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> so I'm going to read 21, 22, 23. And then you'll see 24, 25 on the screen. Or if you have your Bible or your phone, please read along with me in your head. Amen? Amen. Everybody there? Amen. Everybody know where 1 Peter is? Amen. Amen. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT version. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left, listen to this, he left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins, I'm in verse 24, in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd. Oh, and the best piece, the guardian of your souls. Amen. You may be seated. I won't always be a patient. In the first verse, verse 21, and this is why... When I was praying about it, I felt like God was leading me to add this because you got to bring the verses to a full so you can fully understand what Peter is preaching here. Amen. Amen. Verse 21 is giving us and stay with me. This is just I need you to I need you to hear this. Verse 21. Peter is giving us the example that Christ is our example. So he's letting us know that because Christ is our example, that we have to understand with him being the example, we can expect to A, we can try to live like him, first thing. B, Christ being our example, that means the same way he suffered will suffer. And the reason why we have to understand that being as a Christian we may suffer is because every sort of suffering needs some sort of healing. See, and if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus didn't just suffer and never heal. When Jesus suffered on the cross and then he died, he rose again and he had a glorified body. So at some point along the line, his suffering turned to healing and he stayed whole. So if you understand scripture, you understand that even though he suffered and even though I may suffer and I notice. I may not be popular at the end of the day, but I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth in the Bible. Even though I may suffer as a Christian and as a believer in Jesus Christ, that's OK, because I know even someone who suffers in Jesus has a healing and becomes whole. 
in Jesus being my example, I see what he suffered. The Bible calls him in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, they title it the suffering servant because Isaiah gives us a depiction of Jesus's suffering of the whips. I can't wait till Good Friday, y'all. Oh, hallelujah. You better be here on Good Friday, March 29th, because I preach the same thing every year. But it's good because it breaks down to you how Jesus suffered, how they whipped him, how they beat him, how they abused him, how they bruised him. It breaks down to you the the physical suffering he went through. And then the Bible breaks down to you even the mental suffering and anguish that he was enduring all the way to the point to where, you know, the scripture. He says, Father, but not my will, but thy will be done because he was mentally anguished so bad. From the suffering, he knew what he was about to endure, that he had to pray to his father to get some strength. So we understand that Jesus was the suffering servant. But in being the suffering servant, he also was the whole savior. Mm -hmm. And if he is my example, then I may be the suffering servant, but I'm the person who's whole and who's healed as well. So when you hear me tell you, if you believe in Jesus, you've made you're, you're healed, you've been made whole. I'm not telling you that because I want you to like me. I'm telling you that because the Bible says that you are. Mm. Now, this word example is hoopgo ramos. And this word, it literally means it's like to to under and to right. So like hoopo comes from under and then grafo comes from right. So it's like an underwriter. So like if you understand the context back then, it's like someone who was tracing the letters. So somebody who would be like sitting under a teacher, like I would be sitting under Jesus and I would be tracing the letters and writing down what he's writing or writing down what he's saying. So as I'm understanding that example, that means that I'm copying what he did. I'm copying what he said. I'm copying what he's writing. So I'm not creating my own version of it. I'm not putting down my own thoughts or my opinions about his example of life. I'm actually trying to copy and emulate his life and how I see him, how I seen him live or for us today, how I've read about him living because later on it became a way to denote a way or example to follow someone. So this is a way that something should be followed. So when you would see the word and they say Jesus is our example, they're denoting and giving us the understanding that this is how you follow. This is who you follow. So you don't follow based upon your own strength or your own mind or your own soul or your own opinion or your own thoughts. You follow based upon copying down how you saw him live. You follow based upon understanding what was written about him and what's in the text. And you follow based upon that, not based upon how you want to live. So what does this have to do with I won't always be a patient? When we follow Jesus, I, I, I don't want to offend nobody, but when we follow Jesus, we recognize our wholeness. Mm -hmm. I got to talk to you. So many people come to me and tell me that I follow Jesus, but I still ain't whole yet. I don't feel healed. That's a problem. Because when you follow Jesus, the Bible says he is a healer mm -hmm. and he is a deliverer. Yeah. He will deliver me from the pangs of sin and death. That's what the Bible says. It said he delivered us from the pangs of sin and death. So listen, don't get mad. Just, just, just listen to me, please. If you follow Jesus, the mind has to change from I haven't been healed or made whole. But what does scripture say? Scripture says I have been made whole. Scripture says when I take on a new life in Jesus Christ. 
I've been healed. I've been made whole. I've become a new creation. Hear me, hear me. Don't get mad. Hear me. I've been preaching this for like two, three weeks now. You are whole. Not, man, I'm trying and I'm working on it. You are whole. Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament, but he also wrote Romans chapter 6, where he said sin and it comes and sometimes I do what I don't want to do, but it's the sin that is in me. But he never said he wasn't whole. Even... Do you, do you, you got to know the text, even though Paul still made a mistake or even though he said believers make mistakes, even though he said sometimes we suffer because we're still in our flesh from this thing that's called sin. You show me a text in the Bible where Paul said, I am not whole. Come on. Paul never declares he wasn't whole, even though he went through hell. Even though he went through shipwreck, he never says I'm not whole. Even though he got bit by a snake, he never says I'm not whole. Even though he says I suffer from this ailment and this thorn in my side, he never says I'm not whole. Even though he was homeless at times, even though Peter was going house to house, even though Jesus was homeless, even though all of these things were happening, all hell was breaking loose. They was running around the desert trying to stay alive to preach church in small homes. Even though they were doing these things, they never declared they were not whole. Amen. You show me a text in the Bible from the authors. Nobody who authored the text says I'm not whole. All they talk about is my faith in Jesus Christ is what made me whole. They talk about my faith in Jesus is what delivered me. They talk about Jesus delivers from the sin and the death of the world. They talk about Jesus delivered and made you a new creation. They never talk about, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not whole. And I know I'm preaching against a lot of philosophy that you hear in church nowadays, but it's not true. I know it's even a quick tactic to tell you, oh, come to come to church and all my believers, even though you're not whole yet, you'll get there. You were whole the moment you accepted Jesus, baby. Now it's just a faith walk to just move it on out and to just keep on going. But the moment he came into your life and he came into your heart, you was made whole right there in that instant, in that second. Don't leave me by my Myself. The Bible tells me that he's an overseer. He's the guardian of my soul. It's no way that Jesus can be the guardian of my soul and I'm not whole. It don't work like that, baby. It don't act like that, baby. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He's the guardian of my soul. He's the overseer of my life. He is my shepherd. He is my redeemer. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my job. Jehovah Jireh. He is my Jehovah Nisi. He is all that I need because he is the one who made me whole. Stop believing church that you're not whole if you know Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach us that. It's a marketing tactic to make you like the church and to come to church. It's a And listen, we've mismarketed it because it's for those who don't know him it's not for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we've taken it on. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm not. I just need to be whole, Lord. Oh, oh Jesus made me whole. Please heal me, heal me, heal me. We've taken it on. We've marketed it for those who don't know him to get a healing. But what the step we've missed is we haven't told those who know him. We're not marketing this to you. This is for those who don't know him. And when I can start to understand that that's not marketed it for me, now I can be the person who understands I ain't no patient no more. Yeah, yeah. I've been healed. Yeah. I don't want to hang out. In the, who want to hang? <laughs> who wants to hang out in the hospital forever? I don't. You do. Who want to hang out in the hospital forever? Grandma got to take dialysis three times a week. Now she can't stand it. She ain't got to live there. She's got to go to dialysis. You think she want to go? Who done seen people with diabetes got to take dialysis? Cancer, they got to go, ra- go get radiation and chemo. People with diseases that are killing their body. And they got to keep going back and forth to the hospital. You think they want to go? They going because that's the only thing that's keeping their physical body alive. Nobody wants hospital food is terrible. 
I don't know about you. It's terrible. When my wife used to have the babies, I couldn't stand ordering that food. She'd be like, babe, I ordered you something too. Oh, why? <laughs> or she'd be like, baby, can you get us some food? Because I don't want none of that. <laughs> the food is nasty because they don't want you to stay because you cost a lot of money. Mm. Come on. Like you graham crack, you six foot four, 260 pounds, they give you two graham crackers and a little juice. They telling you, Negro, get up out of here. We ain't trying to be serving you. I know how, man, listen, you look like you eat a whole Thanksgiving meal. Like trying to feed you all that. Nelly, you work at one, you know what I'm talking about. They trying to usher you out because they don't want you to stay. And none of us actually want to be there. So why have we turned church into a space where Jesus said he healed us and made us whole, but we always call ourselves a patient? Mm. Now, I want to be clear. I'm talking to those who know Jesus. Yeah. If you don't know Jesus, we need to have another conversation. But if you know Jesus, why are you still talking about you need to go to the hospital? Come on. Listen. Help me. Help me. Once you know Jesus, you go to church for what he did. You go to church to volunteer to help somebody else who is sick. It's just like people when they get healed of their cancer and they ring the bell. Some of those people go back and volunteer and read books and stuff like that because of the healing that they received. They never have to go back to the hospital for no radi radiation and chemo again. Lord willing, it don't come back and they not going back. Now to be getting treatment, they're going back to read, to be a testimony, to talk to people, mm -hmm. to help people walk through the same journey that they went through. Mm -hmm. Why am I bringing this up? Because if you believe in Jesus and you keep thinking you're not whole, you're never going to be able to walk somebody through the journey that you've been through. Mm -hmm. How? If you think that you're not made whole. How are you going to walk somebody else through the journey who ain't been made whole? Your heart may be broken and in pieces, but God puts the pieces back together. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm by myself. Come on. I'm a man and I got six kids and I got a wife and we've been married 10 years this year. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to put my pride to the side. My heart been broken. My heart been all over the place. Peace here, peace there, peace here, peace there, peace here. I might be talking about me and I'm by myself. A peace over here and a peace over here and a peace. Over. Some of y'all still got pieces of your heart back in Philadelphia. Some of you still got pieces of your heart back in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Chicago, down in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, Missouri. Some of y'all still got pieces of your heart all over the country all over the world. But can I say something to you? Come on. You're believing a myth because God made you whole. So while your mind is telling you, oh, I left a, oh, a, a piece of me, a piece of my heart left when that relationship ended. Oh, he still got a piece of my heart. Oh, I need my, give me my heart back. <laughs> <laughs> Not being petty. <laughs> Give me my heart back. I gave him all my heart. He just broke it all up and got it scattered everywhere. When we lived in Denver, we lived in Miami, and now the rest of the pieces in Minneapolis. And he done went to New York on me and left your tail here in Minneapolis. But then you found church. And then you found Jesus. And he put you back together again. But watch this. Then you heard that church is a hospital for the sick. And because you still and you're not perfect, you thought that still applied to you. Come on. Teach, man. I am preaching. You ain't sick no more. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 
you may not be used to hearing that, but that's the text. That's the Bible. And I'm going to prove it to you. If you look at the text and in the Bible, verses 24 and 25, verse 24 makes salvation personal, personal to Jesus. Watch this to Jesus. Your salvation is personal. But did you know it was personal to Jesus Christ himself? Look, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. It was a personal thing for him to make this a transaction. So he took on a per he took on a personal liability. It's like if you co-signed for somebody, he co-signed for your sin. He co-signed for your healing because he knew he had the money to pay for it. He knew even though you couldn't pay for it, he could pay the debt. So he co-signed for your sin. And guess what? If somebody else co-signed for you, you still got to pay the bill. Amen. And if you stop, they just on the hook for it. But you're still paying it. Jesus co-signed for your sin. He co-signed for your healing. He co-signed for your deliverance. He co-signed to be your redeemer. And he said, you don't got to pay anything. I'll co-sign and I'll foot the bill. Yeah. And it says, by his wounds, you are healed. 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 It doesn't say by his wounds you are temporary healed or by his wounds you may be healed. It says, because, I'm going to just read it to you in 2024 language. Because of his wounds, you healed. We're going to make it real simple. Because he was beaten, bruised, battered, whooped, skin scraped off, spat upon, hung on the cross, nails driven through him, disrespected, because all of these things happened to him, it says, you are healed. Mm -hmm. See, my church family, I'm going to say it again, I'm not preaching perfection, but I am preaching to you that you're healed. Yeah. There's, the Bible says it. If you don't believe me, just read the Bible. You're not a patient anymore. And I'll get there. Now watch, once you were like sheep who wandered away. See, you were once. See, remember, once, not still. Remember when Paul would write letters to like Corinth and stuff? He would say, I heard that there's some of you starting to partake in these behaviors that are not of the Lord. And then he would say, but no, do not do that. And let's correct this right now. And he would say, because you once did live like that. But you no longer live like that no more under Jesus Christ. So he would let them know you once lived like that, but you no longer live like that anymore because of what he did. So you once were broken. You once were scattered in pieces everywhere all over the earth. You once were not whole. You once needed a healing. But look. But now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Do you see when you turn to him? By his wounds, you were healed and you once were like sheep who wandered away. But once you turn to him, the guardian of your souls, all healing takes place. And the reason why we need to understand this is because your healing is essential for the hospital. Y'all ever been to the hospital and they kick you out because they got more patients coming in and they don't have any bed space? You need to understand you're healed or you need to meet Jesus and get healed so you can make room in the hospital for somebody else. Do you see? If I still think that I'm not healed and I'm not whole, I'm taking up a bed for somebody who don't know him. But if I know I'm healed and I'm whole, now I can go out and get somebody to come to the bed at the church to receive the same healing that I got. So the more I tell myself I'm not healed, I'm still, oh, I'm not, I'm, the more I tell myself that, I'm taking up a bed space that I don't even need to take up anymore. It's like a placebo. How they give you one drug, the real drug, and then this is the fake drug, and they say, hey, how do y'all feel? What's going on? Oh, this was the fake one, this was the real one, when they do all these tests. The moment you can realize that you don't always want to be a patient is the moment 
that you can get up and you can bring people to the hospital. Does a healed patient stay in the hospital? It doesn't. The only difference between that and the church is a healed patient comes back to the church, but they bring other people with them. A healed patient leaves the hospital. In the church, a healed sinner returns to help other people heal. And I'm not trying to force healing on you or force anything. But what I am trying to get you to see is this. When you recognize you're healed and you're whole, watch how you influence other people to come and get it. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. Do you know why some of us still can't influence nobody even though we have this faith? It's because we still keep telling people that we're sick. I'm going to give you different terminology to use. I'm going to talk to y'all now. I don't even feel like screaming today. I'm going to give you different terminology. Stop telling people, well, I ain't perfect. I'm going to make mistakes too. Tell people, no, I'm whole and you can be whole too. Don't worry about my perfection. Don't worry about that. You worry about the wrong thing. See, I'm trying to get you to see that I'm, I'm whole and I'm healed. Yeah, like, so you might be worried. Well, why you make this mistake? You make that. Don't worry about my mistakes. I ain't worried about yours. I'm trying to get you whole. I'm trying to get you healed. I ain't worried about your mistakes. I ain't worried about your imperfections. Jesus wasn't worried about your mistakes and your imperfections. So it don't matter if somebody else is. Jesus, I don't care about none of that. I still need you to be whole. I still need you to heal. You might have imperfections. You might not be perfect, but I need you to be whole. I need you to be healed because I know who I am and I want you to dwell with me and the Father forever. You need to heal so you can help someone else. So how many of us are prepared to heal today? Come on. Amen. Now that's a real question. And that's a loaded question. I'm going to ask it again. Put your hand up. How many of you are ready to heal today? Amen. You see how easy it is to tell y'all ain't listening? You know Jesus, you put your hand up. 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 I'm ready to heal someone. Help heal someone. That's right. I'm going to ask, how many of you are ready to heal today? How many of you have been healed? You see? How many of you have not been healed? See, we got one hand. But do y'all see what the honesty in the room does? Your honesty brings out somebody else's honesty. Mm -hmm. I ask you again, how many of you are healed? Who knows Jesus? Then everybody's hands should go up. Mm -hmm. If you know him. How many of you are healed? Mm -hmm. I know you're not used to this type of message. Because like I said in the beginning, I can market it to you to tell you that, oh, you need to keep working on your healing and your deliverance. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible, we, we, we go, to, we work towards sanctification. But the Bible says the moment I meet Jesus, I've been delivered. Mm -hmm. So when you tell me you know Jesus, but you can't put your hand up saying that you're healed. It's an indication to me that you're still not understanding what the scripture tells us. Because there's no way that Jesus in the King James is the overseer of your souls. And he's the shepherd. And by his wounds, you are healed. There's no way you can know him. And then still say that I'm not healed. I'm not perfect, but I'm healed. And when I ask you, are you healed? And you can't put your hand up, but you tell me you know Jesus. Come on. You're letting me know you're still not understanding scripture. And that's okay. We'll keep walking through that journey. But I need you to understand scripture that you have been delivered. Not going to be delivered. Not want to be delivered. You have been delivered. 
You have been delivered from sin and death in the grave. You have to remember being delivered does not mean being perfect. Sometimes we think being delivered means being perfect, means being no mistakes. Oh, my God, I, I messed up. But being delivered just means that you're delivered from who you once were and you are now somebody else. When you get delivered, your mind changes, your thoughts change, the things that you do change, the things that you want to do change, and the things that you can't let go of, but you want to, you fight this battle between sin and the struggle in your flesh, and it's a daily war. Yeah. Yeah. But guess what? The war is a symbol of your deliverance. Yeah. It's not a symbol of you being a terrible person. Because there's some people out here who don't even go to war because they don't think they need to be delivered. And that's why you have to recognize that you're healed, because some people you got to go and get and you got to bring them to their seat in the hospital. You got to take a look around you and go through your phone and your Facebook. And you got to realize, man. Jesus made me whole. Jesus healed me. I need somebody else to get that same feeling. Amen. Watch this. Confess and share. James 5, 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Do you see? The Bible says confess them and then pray so you can be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Can you see now? Can you see now? The Bible says that the prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And it's talking about you being healed. That's just what the Bible, I'm not, I don't even got to say nothing. Just read the screen or read your Bible. The Bible says that you, me, we have the power to confess our sins to each other and pray so that people can be healed. This is that's that's just scripture. That's just text. I don't got to elaborate on it because it's self-explanatory. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. What I didn't read to you is when he goes in, he goes in to talk about the prophet in the Old Testament who prayed that there was no rain. And when he prayed that there was no rain and, he, and, and God shut up the rain for was it three and a half years? And he said, then when he prayed again for rain, God opened the windows of heaven and the rain came down. So he gives the example that a person who is righteous and prays earnestly for somebody, they can be healed. What am I saying? The Bible says that Jesus Christ died so those who were not righteous can be made righteous. So what I'm saying is when you accepted Jesus Christ, you became righteous. So what I'm saying is when you accepted him and you became righteous, and I'm talking about really accept him. All right. I ain't talking about, oh, thank you, God. Oh, Jesus, I love you. But then you just you like, I don't really care. I'm going to do whatever. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about the acceptance that makes you want to change and put you in this battle, in this war, in this fight against the flesh. And the Bible says that once you accepted him and you become righteous, you have power and you can produce wonderful results. So what I'm trying to get across to you today is similar to last week, similar to Bible study, similar. You have a power that can produce results. But what holds you back from your power is not believing that you're healed. Do you see? If I don't believe that I'm healed, I won't walk in my power. Watch, if you break your leg and you know it's still broken, you ain't going to try to walk on it. And then when the doctor says that you can, you still are a little tedious and tentative and you, oh, let me check it out. Because you're not 100% sure yet. 
Even though the doctor said, go ahead and walk, we did the x-rays, and you've recovered and everything is fine, you still may be a little nervous. Or some of you may jump down off the table and start running because you trust the doctor. Church, Jesus says you're healed and you're whole. Some of you start running and you jump up and down and you shake your wig out and the brothers start dancing and they start clapping and all of that because you believe it. Some of you, Jesus says, you're healed and you're whole and you sit in your seat wondering, is that actually true? And the huge reason for that is because of the hell that you've been through. Some of you wonder, can Jesus really heal me from the hell that I've been through? Mm. I know it's a question. You don't even have to tell me it's a question. We all have had that question in our faith walk. I don't care who you are. You can front if you want to. You ain't sit up in church your whole life. Oh, Jesus, going to know you. It was one time where you was like, I don't know. It's been a lot going on in my life, you know. It's been happening for a long time. I ain't sure about this one now, Lord. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh, I know what your words say, but ooh, Jesus. What my life say is different. Listen, they about to put my life on Tubi, Jesus. It done been so much going on. So because of what your life has said, y'all better leave Tubi alone now. <laughs> I was so mad when they put the NFL game on Peacock only. I, matter of fact, somebody remind I need to cancel Peacock. I went and bought it for that one month to watch that game. They don't get that $6.99 again. Uh, <laughs> Hey, listen, I'm all over the place. But listen. <laughs> but no, but, but I'm serious. Sometimes your life tells you that you don't believe that you can be made whole. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's so much. Yeah. Am I wrong? Amen. My life told me that. There were some things I never thought I would recover from. Never. But I did. There are some things that you never think you'll recover from, but you will. And guess what? If those things happen after the fact of Jesus, he's already done it. Amen. He's already done it. But I have to believe it. The Bible says no one can please God without having faith. So whatever it is that you think isn't healed or isn't whole, or maybe for you, young lady, that you don't think that he can heal and make whole, he can. There's a wholeness and a completion with Jesus. See, I wish y'all flooded Bible study like you're doing on Sunday. And I'm only saying this to say this, because in Bible study, we started in Genesis, and we're walking through God's dwelling places all the way through Revelation, right? And because we're walking through that, you'll see that everything becomes complete and becomes whole. Everything will one day. When you start in Genesis and everything is broken down and you have Adam and you have Eve and you have the apple from the tree and they bite from it and all these things. And then you continue to go on through this journey of the Bible. You start to learn that when we got to Jesus in the cross and the death and the resurrection and the ascension, which is what we're about to start celebrating, death, resurrection and the ascension, when you get there, you see that everything came full circle. You see that every word of God through the prophets came full circle through Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see that every scripture in the Old Testament about Jesus came full circle. You see that every story and parable that Jesus taught came full circle. You see that Paul was only able to write the letters that he wrote in Peter and John and other people, the letters that they wrote because Jesus had brought everything full circle. So what I'm trying to get you to see is that Jesus has brought everything full circle and now he's given us the power to produce those same results. So because everything has been brought full circle for me, it, I, get, I, I, am, I love it. it. It makes me just get excited and, and I have great joy if I see it come full circle for you. Because it ain't for me, young lady, it's for you. Because I know what the full circleness brings. Yeah. 
I know what happens when everything comes together and all the dots are connected in my life. I know what happens when that circle no longer is broken apart or it's not a pie shape and all these different squares, but it's one circle and it's 100 percent and it's Jesus. I know what happens when it's not broken. You ever had like them charts and it's broke? Oh, it's 10 percent here, 10 percent there, 20 percent here, 30 percent there. And you got to add all of these percentages up. I know what happens when everything becomes whole and that circle is one circle and it's all come together and it's all 100 percent and it's all him. And because I know how that feels, it motivates me for you to feel it, too. It motivates me for you to feel it, for you to feel it, for you to feel it, for them. For the, it motivates me for young, the young people to feel it. It motivates me for you to feel it, for you to feel it, for all of you. So I may not preach to you in a way that makes you feel like you're going to leave here and get a million dollar contract. But I will preach to you to let you know the million dollar contract can still keep you in pieces. Oh, but Jesus can make you whole. The new job can still have you in pieces. But Jesus can make you whole. Your new boo can have you in pieces and have you all over the earth. But Jesus can make you whole. So I want to preach to you letting you know that it's Jesus who makes you whole and not all the other things. I might be too truthful if I say this, but I have to. If How is my family whole if Jesus isn't at the center? How is my marriage whole if Jesus isn't at the center? Oh, we married, yeah, blue, 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 but Jesus ain't at the center. We're missing the core structure of our foundation. The core structure of it. How, watch this, the world isn't whole if Jesus doesn't hold it together. The Bible tells us that he's holding the world and he's keeping everything in place. If you don't believe me, just call NASA and ask them. No, I'm serious. <laughs> NASA may not believe in Jesus, but they can't deny that there's some powerful forces that hold our world together that we can't explain. And they'll give you a bunch of names and they'll tell you, oh, well, we think it's this, this and this. But science is always a scientific theory. We went and watched the asteroids in outer space and the asteroid hunters. Y'all ever go take your kids to the science museum. And there's these people and they get paid to go follow asteroids and then they, they come up with plans in case the asteroid ever comes into our atmosphere, how to knock it off course or blow it up or whatever so it doesn't hit the earth. So they're preparing for an asteroid to hit earth because they said it's not a matter of if but when. So what I'm saying to you is this. You can call it what you want. There's only one force powerful enough to keep all of that in place. Amen. Amen. I don't care what you call it. There's only one force powerful enough to keep that in place. You can believe it sprouted out of nowhere and it just happened on happenstance. That's fine. But even happenstance had to happen somewhere. It's only one force powerful. And that same force is the force that's giving you the power to heal. The same force. So if that force that can hold the worlds and shape and frame the worlds and keep the comets from hitting us and create all these other things, if that same force can do that, why has it not made you whole? Do you see? Do you see? I'm not going to mark it to you today. I'm going to ask you to come down here and pray and believe that you're whole. If you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to come down here and talk to him and receive what feeling whole feels like so then you can be what it looks like. Don't let that go over your head. When you know what it feels like on the inside, you can live what it looks like on the outside. See, it's only a few people who say yes to that. But I want you to come down here because... You have to believe that you have a power that has healed you over the power that has told you you're not healed. I can't believe it for you. All I can do is give you a word and some Bible scriptures. 
but you have to believe it because you don't always want to be a patient. Who's tired of the hospital? Now who wants to bring their friend to the hospital who's sick? See, if you love them, remember, remember the sermon we preach, healing isn't, isn't for you, it's for everybody else. I wasn't, I didn't find Jesus and become healed and made whole for myself. It was so I can talk to y'all. It was so I can meet you. So I can talk to you, teach you, so I can use whatever God has put over my life for you, not for me. This message right here isn't a message I get anything from. Maybe that's why I'm not preaching it all crazy. There's ones where I'm getting something too, y'all can tell. Listen, <laughs> but this message is for you. It ain't for me. This message is, is for the ones who believe in Jesus, but still think that you're not whole. It's for the ones who don't want to believe in Jesus, but need to understand he can put the pieces together if you let him. Mm -hmm. It's a journey and it's a walk. And it's not easy, but he can. That's who this is for. Mm -hmm. So I want to open the altar. I want whoever wants to understand you've been made whole to come down. Or if you want to be whole to come down. We'll play music. I'll probably still talk. But the altar's open. The music will play. But even if the music doesn't play, who needs to recognize their wholeness? And let's get real. Because what if you recognize that you need, y'all can come, just because I'm talking don't mean you ain't got to come. What if you not recognize that your whole is keeping your brother from coming? Or your sister, or your mother, or your father, or your grandmother, or your best friend? What if you not recognizing that you made, you've been made whole is what's keeping you to continuously travel down that same path and that same journey that you want God to take you from. Think about that. Because I don't believe I'm healed and I'm whole, that's a pressure, right? And it's like a mechanism that makes me feel like a failure, right? How many of you feel like a failure when you know you want God to make you whole from something and, and, and you want to be healed, and, but you feel like he's not, and so you go back to your old way and then you feel like you fail? I'm preaching my life a little bit too in that one. And you go back and now you feel like a failure, like man. And the more and more and more I feel like a failure, the less and less I believe Jesus works. Don't let that go over your head. The more and more you feel like a failure, the less and less Jesus works in your mind. But the reality is, you know how I can prove it to you you're not a failure? Because Jesus didn't fail you. If you're a failure, that makes him a failure. And I'll prove it to you because the Bible says if you know him, where does he reside? Come on, somebody, don't leave me by myself. Where does he reside? In you. So how can you be a failure with the God of the universe living on the inside of you? The math ain't math in family. The math don't math on that. I'm not worthy of him to be on the inside of me. But even though I'm not worthy, where is he? Right here. Even though I'm not worthy. 